Hello and welcome to Lesson 7 of 12 in the study of the Gospel of Mark, presented by Mark Hill for the British Bible School. If our perception of the Bible is that it's just a human book, or that it only becomes God's word when it speaks to us, we'll have no sure guidelines about it. We'll just take from it the commands and principles that suit us, and we'll leave aside those that don't, as relics of a past and different culture. Or, perhaps, we will try to change the meaning of biblical statements to suit our desires or to reflect the current cultural climate of our society. On the other hand, if we approach the Bible confident that it is God's once given authoritative and absolute word relevant for all people in all places at all times, then we can have confidence about what God says. We continue to look at what God says as we go through the book. We have looked at the preparation for Jesus' ministry in chapter 1 up to verse 13. We have gone from verse 14 in chapter 1 to the end of chapter 9, looking at his ministry in Galilee. And now he begins his journey to Jerusalem in Mark chapter 10. From the map, we see the journey that he's making, that he's taking from Capernaum down to Jerusalem. He quietly left Capernaum, heading towards the borders of Judea before crossing the Jordan River. He preached there before going to Jericho. This trip from Galilee was the last one he would make before his death. We'll read the first 12 verses of that chapter. Then Jesus left Capernaum and went down to the region of Judea and into the area east of the Jordan River. Once again, crowds gathered around him, and as usual, he was teaching them. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife? Jesus answered them with a question. What did Moses say in the law about divorce? Well, he permitted it, they replied. He said a man can give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away. But Jesus responded, he wrote this commandment only as a concession to your hard hearts. But God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Later, when he was alone with his disciples in the house, they brought up the subject again. He told them, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries someone else, she commits adultery. This passage has tended towards one of two extremes with regard to the issue of divorce, either a broad allowance of all divorces or a rejection of all grounds for divorce. And this is what Jesus is having to deal with here. So we read there that some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife? From this question, we can infer that men were doing exactly that. It was also the case in Moses' time, leading him to give the original divorce regulations. Because of sin, marriage relationships deteriorate and fragment for many reasons, in addition to adultery. Having been asked the question, Jesus answered them with a question. What did Moses say in the law about divorce? Well, he permitted it, they replied. He said a man can give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away. Divorce regulations were given by Moses to put a boundary around how husbands treated their wives when they divorced them and to protect the reputation of wives who were divorced for no good reasons. Divorce was taking place already, and Moses was protecting those who were innocent victims in this thing. Did God approve of these divorces? Of course, we have to say, he does not. He doesn't approve of divorce. Rather, in his compassion, he permitted them and legally regulated this breakup of marriages that had developed because of sin. God does not hate the divorcee. He hates the divorce, what it means, how it affects people, the hardship and the heartache that it brings. 
So Jesus responds again. About Moses, he said, he wrote this commandment only as a concession to your hard hearts. Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. Matthew 19 and verse 8 adds, but this is not the way it was from the beginning. Divorce seems to be a divine compromise due to sin. It is evidence of God's compassionate grace. In the same way that biblical regulations stating what to do in the event of a rape do not endorse rape, rather it spells out what must happen to protect the victim of, of rape. So here we have a divorce. Someone is innocent and they need to be protected. So regulations were introduced to do just that because they weren't being protected. Jesus goes on to say, but God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two, but one, let no one split apart what God has joined. So, of course, adulterers in the Old Testament face the death penalty. You can see Leviticus 20 and verse 10 and Deuteronomy 22 and verse 22 for this. The death penalty is an indication of how abhorrent marital unfaithfulness is in God's eyes. It also, of course, removed the need for divorce. So this is not what's at question here. If it was proven that someone was an adulterer, they were stoned to death and the marriage was ended. You can't divorce a dead person. We know from Genesis chapter 3 that sin entered into the world and with that entrance problems happened between Adam and Eve, males and females. Verse 16 of chapter 3 says there'll be a desire to the woman to control your husband but he will rule over you. There will be this tension. Not everyone experiences this to the same degree but there are problems in marriages in relationships because of sin. Now divorce was not permitted because there was no better way. The better way was established at creation. God knew how he wanted things to be. Now note that Jesus didn't say in the beginning as though that was then and this is now. He said from the beginning meaning that from creation right up to the present day, which was Jesus' day, a permanent monogamous union has always been God's order for marriage. From the beginning right up to the present time, our time, marriage is a permanent union between one man and one woman. The sexual union in marriage between a man and a woman makes that union one flesh. It was inseparable from personal permanent unity. So only by sexual unfaithfulness can that unity, once established by God, be broken by people. It doesn't mean that sexual unfaithfulness is worse than any other sin. We are being told in this instance that it breaks up a marriage. Note the distinction between God and man. What God has made, do not let man break. Let's look at an example of a regulation of protection to someone in this particular situation. In Leviticus 21 verses 10 and 11, it speaks of a master who has married one of his slaves. And now he goes on to marry another woman. It says in verse 10 of Leviticus 21, if he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish her food, speaking of the first wife, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, or her marital rights. And if he does not do these three things for her, she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. So the text here explains that a man marries a second woman, but he is not permitted to deprive his first wife of what she needs especially not a slave. She would be destitute. What on earth can she do to look after herself? If he doesn't do this, 
if he doesn't provide food uh, and clothing and conjugal rights, then he is in dereliction of his duty. And if he doesn't do it, the law permits her to divorce her husband, to walk away from him because he's not looking after her. So this significant passage seems to give three valid reasons for divorce. The fact that it relates to a slave woman and revolves around polygamy shouldn't lead us today to dismiss its relevance. The Bible contains many types of laws, and this particular kind is what scholars call case law. Dr. David Instone Brewer, research librarian with Tyndale House, says this. Then, as now, some laws were written as statutes, summarising a whole subject area, such as divorce, while other laws were case laws. Case law is a collection of decisions made by judges in actual cases that established a new legal principle. These rulings can then be applied to other cases that share something in common with the case that established the principle. For example, the statute law on keeping the Sabbath is part of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 verses 8 to 11, but it does not define the punishment for breaking it. When a man was caught gathering sticks on a Sabbath in Numbers chapter 15 verses 32 to 36, his case was brought before Moses, who decided that he deserved death. This story with the decision about the punishment became an item of case law. The principle derived from it is that breaking the Sabbath law makes one liable to the death penalty. These case laws then, though arising out of unique situations, have an element of universal application. What was true for the rights, freedoms and protections of the slave woman were equally true for the full-fledged member of the people of Israel. A principle for one woman in one context becomes the principle for all women in Israel's larger community. In ancient marriages, as in modern ones, husbands and wives commit to protection and provision and faithfulness of each other. The certificate that was given didn't make a couple divorced, it simply recognised what was already a reality. Pieces of paper, court cases, judicial rulings, these don't end marriages. Broken marriages are a result of broken vows. The Bible just acknowledges this aspect of the fallenness of our world, and yet offers grace and mercy to the victim of these broken vows. It is of course vital that we understand the Old Testament laws offered grace to those who were the victims of broken vows. You could not, under the Mosaic law, divorce your spouse for any and every reason, though this was taking place. Now the Pharisees knew that, and therefore they asked this question in order to merely trick Jesus. The New Testament doesn't reject or disregard the Old Testament teaching on divorce. The Bible is one book. The same God is God over all of these teachings. Jesus' teaching specifically clarifies the interpretation of Deuteronomy 24 and verse 1, but it doesn't provide a comprehensive teaching on all divorce. He's dealing with a particular question at this particular time. God does not allow for all divorce. God's way is that we marry and we stay married and we stay faithful and we provide for and protect our spouse. So he doesn't allow for all divorce, but his disapproval of some kinds of divorce, does it mean that all divorce is unacceptable? Now, I know, in a sense, all divorce is unacceptable. But are there circumstances where God permits it for the protection of the person who's a victim? Can you divorce for any reason is the question. And the answer is no, you cannot divorce for any reason. You cannot. 
Moses only allowed it because of your hard hearts. The way it was from the beginning is the way it should have been all of the time. Jesus was not declaring something new. He was calling people back to God's way. That's why I went back to the creation story, taking it from there, from the beginning to the present time. Let's continue to read from verse 10. Later, when he was alone with his disciples in the house, they brought up the subject again. He told them, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries someone else, she commits adultery. They're continuing this conversation in the same context as it was being dealt with, with those outside. So later with the disciples, it seems Jesus assumes that the divorced will remarry. Such a marriage after a willful divorce, for any reason, as it's called, is adultery, because the cause of the divorce was not legitimate. If marriage vows are broken, the marriage is ended. However we look at this, whatever conclusion we personally come to, we must try to hold to the highest standard of relationships as God created us, as God wants for us. These days it can be a very complex uh, thing and we need help navigating a variety of situations. We see cases of decades long infidelity and deception. We see cases involving psychological and verbal abuse, along with physical intimidation. We see cases that clearly qualify for biblical divorce, cases that do not, and cases that require careful clarification. But what's important it all in all of this? How we talk to and treat those who disagree with us could win or lose their soul. It is a difficult subject, but who are we? to make judgments on people whose shoes we've not walked in, as they say. No one is perfect, and there are occasions of failure within marriage. When we fail, the key is to repent and seek the necessary help to not repeat the sin. But patterns of failure, however, reveal a lack of repentance and a constant betrayal of the marital agreement between their spouse and God. What do we do about that? Must people continue to put up with that situation? What did Moses say? How did God allow Moses to deal with it? And what about those who have already remarried and realized that maybe what they did was wrong? Well, those who have already remarried after an unbiblical divorce, are required now to be faithful to their sec second marriage partner, in my opinion. The notion that someone is in a state of perpetual adultery because of their second marriage is not corroborated, I don't think. Jesus teaches that the initial act of remarriage after uh, an unreasonable divorce is adultery. But another divorce is not the solution. Two wrongs do not make a right. Any believer who is now in a marriage after what would be termed a wrongful divorce is called by God to love their spouse faithfully and fulfill their covenant obligations just as they should have in their first marriage. There is forgiveness for both the divorcee and for the person who was remarried. How we deal with these things depends on that particular situation, but it has to be done with compassion. We do need to face up to sin if we've done something sinful. There does need to be repentance. The advice could be, rather than a divorce, separate for a while so that you can come back together once you've worked things out after the, the, the storm has died down, as it were. But how we treat people, how we talk to people, can so often just add to the torment that someone is facing in that relationship. Let's be compassionate. 
what we do need to do, of course, is think positively about marriage. We know that marriages fail and there's great upsets, but it can be a good thing. One of the main reasons why is that it's God's idea. If it doesn't work out, it's because someone is not following God's plan. Commitment is essential to a successful marriage and romance is important. It can hold times of great joy. In a subject like this, we concentrate on the difficult times, but it can be something that gives great joy to the couple and to their children. Marriage creates the best environment for raising children, no matter what people in the world with their warped idea of what family might be, say. Marriage is between a man and a woman is the best environment for raising children. Unfaithfulness, though, breaks the bond of trust, which is the foundation of all relationships. We should view marriage as permanent, and this is something that we're going to work at and try and keep as God intended. And ideally, only death should dissolve marriage. But it's based on the principled practice of love and not on feelings. And sometimes this is where it goes wrong. Our feelings are hurt. We don't feel that things are going right. Well, we need to decide to. Marriage is a living symbol of Christ and the church. So we need to try and demonstrate the best example of that that we possibly can. A marriage, of course, is good and honourable. But we know, and I know, it takes two. And if one doesn't want to follow this plan, doesn't want to follow God's plan, then what do we do about the innocent party? Do we add more punishment to the emotional damage that they've suffered? Do we reject them, even though the physical abuse they've had to leave has left them heartbroken? There needs to be more compassion where these things are concerned. God is love. And by his grace, through Moses, he permitted people to get a divorce because of the situations that they were in, even though he hated it. And as much as we must hate divorce, so we don't let it happen to us. What about those times when things have gone badly, badly and sadly wrong? The way in which we treat others will go a long way to helping them see Jesus as a loving, compassionate father. So you might reject what I've said about the subject here. And in two years time, I might change my mind and reject what I've said here. This is something I believe that is permanent as far as God's word is concerned. But my understanding is something that will grow. Look at the disciples. Jesus teaches them and they didn't understand what he said. And maybe I'm making a misunderstanding here. Let's be gracious with each other as we try to fathom out these things and learn what's best, what's right according to God and his word, and what's right for the people we're trying to help encourage to serve Jesus. Of course, one of the best things we can do is take note of Jesus' teaching here. We continue to read, one day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. He said to them, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Then he took the children in his arms and placed his hands on their heads and blessed them. Why were the children there? Most people were bringing their friends to Jesus because they were sick and they wanted them healing. Doesn't seem that these children were sick. Uh, probably they weren't even old enough to be taught. That was another reason that people would surround Jesus and ask him questions. They came to learn, but maybe these children weren't really old enough to be taught. What did he do about them? The disciples wanted them sent away so they didn't bother Jesus. However, he blessed them. 
And in doing so, it makes the point that the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Well, full grown people misgovern pride and imitate the simple, humble ways of children. The Pharisees who think they know it all will not in humility receive Jesus and as such will not enter the kingdom. They have to give up their pride. They have to give up their self-importance and fully trust in Jesus to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now I wanted to do this earlier in um, our study but didn't get round to it because the lessons were quite long. So I put it in here where we just noticed really some of the prominent religious groups in Jesus' day. And this is a chart that is taken from Tyndale as well. The Pharisees were a very strict group of religious Jews who advocated obedience to the most minute portions of the Jewish law and the traditions. And that's the problem. So many traditions, not necessarily God's law. They were very influential in the synagogues. In agreement with Jesus, they had respect for the law and belief in the resurrection of the dead and a commitment to obeying God's will. Their disagreement with Jesus was that they rejected his claim to be the Messiah because he didn't follow their traditions and he associated with notoriously wicked people. We read of the Sadducees as well, who were the wealthy upper class, the Jewish priestly party. They rejected the authority of the Bible and, well, the scriptures, I should say, beyond the five books of Moses. They profited from business in the temple and along with the Pharisees, they were one of the two major parties of the religious high council. They did, however, show great respect for the five books of Moses, as well as the sanctity of the temple. They denied the resurrection of the dead and thought the temple could also be used as a place to transact business. The teachers of the religious law were really the professional interpreters of the law, the rabbis, who especially emphasised, again, the traditions. So many of these were Pharisees. They had respect for the law and they committed to obeying God, but they denied Jesus' authority to reinterpret the law. They rejected Jesus as the Messiah because he didn't obey all of their traditions. There were the supporters of Herod, a Jewish political party of Herod's supporters, and as far as their agreement with Jesus is concerned, it's unknown. In the Gospels, they tried to trap Jesus with questions and they certainly plotted to kill him. They were afraid of Jesus causing political instability. They saw Jesus as a threat to their political future at a time when they were actually trying to regain from Rome some of their lost political power. We read of zealots and uh, they were a fiercely dedicated group of Jewish patriots determined to end Roman rule in Israel. And they were concerned about the future of Israel. They believed in the Messiah, but didn't recognise Jesus, who was the one sent by God. They believed that the Messiah must be a political leader who would deliver Israel from Roman occupation and restore Israel to the, the, the kingdom it once was. The Essenes were a Jewish monastic group practising ritual purity and personal holiness. They emphasised justice, honesty and commitment and they believed that ceremonial rituals made them righteous. So whilst these religious leaders were usually the ones asking the questions, here we have someone else coming along to ask in Mark 10 verses 17 to 22. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honour your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. 
Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell and he went away sad for he had many possessions. Jesus has just told us that to enter the kingdom of God we must do so like a little child, totally dependent and helpless, not counting on our own merit. Well obviously this young man wasn't present to hear what he needed to do. He didn't hear and so he comes to ask Jesus the very question that Jesus has just answered. The question the young man asks is what must I do to inherit eternal life? If only he'd got there a little sooner. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection, the Sadducees didn't. So from this it seems, and also by his adherence to the law, that the young man has been influenced by the Pharisees. He has a belief in life beyond the grave, and he keeps a strict adherence to the commandments. Now prior to his conversion, of course, the Apostle Paul had similar confidence in his legal righteousness. But when he met the risen Christ, he considered this perceived personal righteousness as worthless, useless as far as his salvation was concerned. And he writes about that in Philippians chapter 3, verses 3 to 9. Now notice that this young man believes that he has to do something to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus answered him in terms of his own mindset, and he listed not the Ten Commandments, but the final six of the Ten Commandments. In addition, Jesus also told him, no one is good, except God. The young man having addressed Jesus as good teacher now promotes his own goodness and declares that he's kept all of these commands since he was a boy and most likely in terms of external obedience to these commands he has done everything that he should. Jesus doesn't correct him nor does Jesus point out as he did in the Sermon on the Mount that behind the actions that are prohibited by these external commands are the attitudes of the heart from which the actions arise and which incur the same guilt and condemnation as the external actions of wrongdoing. An external Pharisaic righteousness is not enough to secure admission to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus already pointed it out, but I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So rather than discuss the young man's claim to obedience, Jesus moves the conversation to a deeper level. Because there are four other commandments that he didn't quote that are focused on our attitude to God. In particular, there's the first commandment in which God commands, you shall have no other gods before me. Jesus challenged the young man at the very centre of his being. What he asked him to do was in effect a challenge to put God first and to value eternal life with God, to value admission to God's kingdom more than he valued his earthly wealth and possessions and even his goodness, the way in which he valued himself. So here Jesus makes him think. In his desire for life with God, is it greater than his desire for physical and financial comfort? Is his desire to be in the kingdom of God greater than his desire to hold on to his wealth? Will he submit to God regardless of the cost? You see, for some of us, it might not be wealth, but there might be something else in life that we find difficult to put before God. Is his desire actually for God or is his desire for eternal life? Is it self-centred? He doesn't want to go to the other place. He wants eternal life. Well, does he value it more than his love for his wealth? 
there's quite an irony to this encounter. You see, this man wants to know how to inherit eternal life. Well, he who is the life is standing right before him and he can't see him. This man wants to know how to enter the kingdom of God. And yet he who is the king of the kingdom is standing right before him and commands his allegiance and he doesn't realise it. This man wants to be accepted by God. Well, guess what? He who is God is standing before him, loving him, and he doesn't know it. He wants to know the way to life. The one who is the way says to him, follow me. And what does he do? He turns and walks away from him. A little child with no perceived worthiness, unencumbered by wealth, unencumbered by self-sufficiency, would have run straight into the arms of Jesus. Not so this rich, young, law-abiding man, unfortunately. So what do we learn about wealth and the kingdom? Jesus looked around and said to his disciples how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. This amazed them. But Jesus said again, Dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus' comment to his disciples when the young man walked away was how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom. The amazed disciples when Jesus repeated this statement, didn't know what to think. And he added, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And this amazed them even more. So, who can be saved? Why did they ask such a question as that? Well, popular religious perceptions equated wealth with the blessing of God. If someone was rich, then for them, it was certain that they were obviously good because God had blessed them. Old Testament perceptions of material blessings are actually symbolic of the New Testament spiritual blessings that believers have in Jesus Christ. People who select these Old Testament verses fail to understand that this perception is about a spiritual truth, not about what's going to happen to you now in this life. Jesus spoke against the large amounts that were cast into the temple treasury by the rich. They have no thought about it, no feeling about it, because they had so much they gave out of what they had. He pronounced woes on the rich. They'd already received their consolation, he says in Luke chapter 6 and verse 24. He told a parable about a rich fool whose preoccupation with his wealth actually caused him to ignore God in Luke 12. He also told a parable about an exceedingly rich man totally insensitive to spiritual realities when he was alive. So he ended up in hell when he died in Luke chapter 16 from verse 19. So how can wealth be a problem? Wealth, rather than being a sign of God's blessing, frequently replaces or inhibits faith in God. And this is what we need to be wary of. The worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful, he told us in the parable of the sower way back in Mark chapter 4. There is a danger to wealth. We're told in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verses 6 to 10, where Paul writes that godliness with contentment is great gain. If we have food and clothing, we will be contented with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. 
Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. There, that's, that, that's the often misquoted verse. The love of money is a root of all evils. Money itself can be used for good or bad. It can't make its own decision. It's up to us and how we use it. And we see the snare that people get caught up into. These easy ways to gamble online that are ruining lives and gambling that's ruined lives for people in the past. Why? The desire to be rich makes them lose their sense of what they ought to be doing. And it can make people lose their sense of what's right with God. The money itself isn't a problem. It's how we view it and whether we are putting it before God in our worship. Again, Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17 and says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. The wealth itself is not a problem. How we handle it or how we can't handle it is the problem. But however it's handled, it has to be second to God. It cannot be before God in anything that we do. It continues in verse 27. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. Then Peter began to speak up. We've given up everything to follow you, he said. Yes, Jesus replied. And I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and property, along with persecution. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be least important then. And those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. Jesus didn't backtrack. Rather, he reinforced what he'd already said by affirming the offensive conclusion that they'd reached, that if it depends on man, it's not possible to be saved. It is impossible, not only for the rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven himself. We can't do it. No one can do it. But Jesus immediately relieved the situation by adding, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Here again is something that's taken out of context and misused and abused. All things are possible with God. They've just encountered the rich young man. And from the human viewpoint, this young man should surely qualify as someone who has been blessed to get into the kingdom of heaven because of their worldly viewpoint. And Jesus says, no, he can't. So now they're wondering, well, if someone who's been as blessed by God as that can't do it, who can? He was young. He was rich. He was morally good. He acknowledged the spiritual dimensions of life. He kept the law. He came seeking an answer to a significant spiritual question. He was a seeker as well. He ticks all of the boxes. But he didn't get the eternal life that he saw. He was depending on his own human resources in keeping the law and in the wealth that he had. And by doing that, he could not be saved. Jesus, uh, Peter then says to Jesus, well, what about us then? We've left everything to follow you. You wanted him to do that. We've actually gone ahead and done it. Well, they may have not been rich. They may not have left as much as the rich young man was going to have to give away, according to the commandment of Jesus. They uh, uh, had left all they had to follow Jesus, even though it wasn't as much. And was it enough? Are they saved? Are they blessed by God? God recompenses those 
who follow him in this world with multiplied replacements. By including brothers, sisters, mothers, children, it alerts us to the fact that Jesus is not speaking precisely literally. These additional relatives speak of the close and loving relationships that exist between believers, not of additional blood relatives. You can, after all, only have one blood mother. Given this non-literal meaning, we must be careful then how we understand the other items that Jesus promises, homes and fields, etc. We can't assume that Jesus means that all who are going to follow him will somehow become property magnets, become very successful with all of these things. What's going to happen? You see, some have taken the phrase all things are possible to mean that if you believe hard enough, you can have all the good things in life. Just believe it and that house will be yours. Believe it and that new car will be yours. Was Jesus talking about these material possessions or was he talking about something spiritual, the kingdom of God? It is not possible for us to enter without Jesus help, but with God, all things are possible. Some have misused the statement, as I've said, for their own gain. There will, however, be persecution in this world for those who follow Jesus. We have to count the cost. And he isn't promising us all of these wonderful, worldly, pleasurable things. He's promising us persecution. But he gives eternal life to those who follow him. And this is what's vital. This is what's important. And this is what we've got to put at the front of our minds, not gain in any other way. The values of the kingdom turn the values of humans upside down. Those who are considered first by the world, the rich and the famous, will be last. Those considered last, the poor and anonymous, will be first.